Welcome to the next installment of What's in a Game. Unfortunately for me and Grace, we are coming after a very sorry Game 6 blowout uh, by the Wolves who destroyed the Nuggets in Game 6. So, I think it was the worst playoff loss in franchise history. Yeah, there was a stat, or they put on the screen something like one of the biggest... What was the stat? It was some kind of stat it was about like, like biggest the score. Fourth, no, it was the second biggest margin of victory by a team facing elimination, yeah, which was crazy. So I'm like, what? Yeah. 45 points isn't the biggest. Play. So not only have there been probably bigger playoff losses, like it, like margins in some other games, but also there's a, there's one by another team that was facing elimination that yeah. won by more than 45 points. I think it was from like the 50s. I will say some of what we talked about in the series was just about how the Wolves would be since they were sort of inexperienced. Not like they are complete. They're like a young Thunder team, but they haven't had a lot of playoff runs. So um, they answered the questions about how they would look if they were facing elimination. They played desperate. The Nuggets seem to relax after the amazing Jokic game that we had, which wasn't totally surprising to me because I've always said that we always trade in a really good win for a bad loss, especially in the regular season. And it looks like we had the best Jokic game and flipped it for one of the worst losses we've had in the Jokic era. I think that is the worst loss. Yeah. It's the worst I playoff loss I wasn't in the franchise. I wasn't sure how to classify it, but I wouldn't argue against it. Um, yeah, let's look at the playoffs as they currently stand. The Celtics beat the Cavs. Finally, that wasn't a difficult series for them, although they did drop one game. The rest of yeah, the series... Yeah, they packed them up. Yeah. We yeah. should probably talk a little bit about the, the context. So, like, the Celtics should have taken care of the Cavs. Like, this is nothing really to do with Boston, but uh, Donovan Mitchell caught a... It was a calf strain this time, actually. Another calf strain. And I believe he did not play in game four or five. I don't remember if he played in game three. Um, and in addition to that, Karis Levert, who is their sort of sixth man off the bench, and he was starting in place of Donovan. Um, I believe he had like a hip, hip contusion, if I'm not mistaken, that took him out of both games four and five. So it was really all about Darius Garland and Evan Mobley. And in particular in game five, the only reason that game was close is because Marcus Morris Sr. was absolutely cooking the Celtics. Once he cooled off, they were able to close the deal. But um, yeah, that, uh, that series was significantly less interesting than the other three because of the difference in the mm -hmm. level of uh, just competitiveness yeah. of the two teams. Even if Cleveland had been healthy, I fully would have expected Boston to take care of them in five or six at the most. I thought, like, since the Knicks were hurt, that the Pacers were just going to cruise through the rest of the series and win the games. And then I thought, you know, I had questions well, about whether well, or not. We saw, we saw how the Pacers were when they were facing Giannis less Dameless Bucks. Which is what? <laughs> which is Danilo Gallinari. Well, Chris Middleton, like, really had some heroic efforts in that series too. But they were playing Danilo Gallinari heavy rotation minutes in playoff games against the Indiana Pacers and Indiana like let the Bucks blow them out. But it was at home. It was in Milwaukee to be fair in that game five. But then Indiana took care of it in six. And it's not like Indiana Indiana's not in the same position that they were in that series where they were up three one and against an injured team because they were only they were able to tie up the series against the Knicks after OG got injured because he has a hamstring thing that made, made him miss the latter part of game I think it was game two and then uh in game three which was still competitive in Indiana came down to the clutch and we talked about that last episode but then in game four New York got absolutely boat raced and in game five New York boat raced Indiana and they made some interesting adjustments mm -hmm. that we'll talk about in that segment. But yeah, it's not like I, I didn't expect Indiana to roll this Knicks team 
I gave the Knicks, it's basically 50-50 now because Indiana absolutely has the talent edge, especially offensively, um, and the energy edge. New York uh-huh. is now playing with a seven-man rotation against a very energetic Indiana Pacers team. It's weird because it's a seven-man rotation, including Alec Burks, who had a great game. was not in the rotation like through the whole first round of the yeah. playoffs. Well, I was thinking the Pacers were going to hopefully give the Celtics a little resistance that they have not had at all this playoffs. But the Knicks played really well in the last game. So, you know, the Knicks are just always going to play hard no matter how many people they have. Like, so I'm a little more hopeful that if they do play the Celtics and they win this Pacers series that they could put some resistance. I'm not saying they're going to win, but at least the games might be close. Maybe they'll win two games. I don't know, but uh, we'll see. So, But let's talk about uh, the Denver game. We didn't record after game five because I was hoping we would just win game six and the series would be over and we yeah. could just bask in the glory of it. Um, That's what happened is that uh, we got punished because Will got greedy. Yes. The Nuggets should have been more greedy and closed the game, closed the series out. Um, but Jokic had one of his best performances. Some people were saying his best game ever. So that's kind so of interesting. Oh, I was hearing best game, period. Oh, some people think that. Yeah. They haven't so, seen the, the Pelicans game that yeah. Larry Nance Jr. is so fond of. But I think people just inherently like playoff game has more worth than regular season. So they're going to vault it up over that. But um yeah it was kind of cool to see i i think when i watched it i wasn't like thinking this is the best Jokic game ever but in retrospect i was like i guess sure i guess i could see it but he was amazing he's you know 40 point game he was scoring in all kinds of ways is there anything you want to say about that game before we jump into game six i have a lot to say about that game because i think the nuggets the the counters by both teams kind of flow into each other so game five, it was an absolute Jokic master masterclass, right? 40 points, seven rebounds, 13 assists, two steals a block. Uh, he was great on both ends of the floor. And it wasn't just the plays with the steal and the block. Like his positional um, his positional defense was really good in that game as the Nuggets went into a high, a high dose of um, Jokic playing at the level against Ant uh, pick and rolls. Mike Conley didn't play in game five, and that played a huge role in the Wolves' offensive struggles because he is their best decision maker. But yeah, the nah, thing that... Oh, go ahead. Nah was able to hit some shots in his absence, but it made it really tough when we were doubling Ant to get any kind of um, outlet pass and then have Conley running running things from that. Right, right. So the Wolves definitely made some shots off of that. But if the rotations were crisp, then it was difficult for the Wolves to make plays out of it because they don't have, uh, you know, the most reliable passing or playmaking outside of Conley. And uh, the thing that impressed me the most about that game, obviously, Jokic was amazing, but the Nuggets offense was... Uh, really clicking. They went with a really heavy dose of all kinds of pick and rolls that involved Jokic either screening or handling with every nugget on the floor. Um, There was a lot of 4-5 pick and roll where AG was handling and trying to set Jokic up often for uh, a switch onto Rudy or um, just catch and cat out of position. Uh, they did some inverted pick and pop with the KCP. So Jokic driving and taking two defenders with them, especially in transition, semi-transition, which we've talked about a lot. We saw some 5-1 inverted pick and roll with Reggie, where like Jokic's doubled at the top, it's two smalls on him, catches Reggie on the roll, and he hits this like beautiful floater. And then in the fourth quarter of that game, they ran a bunch of uh, empty side uh, pick and roll with uh, Jogic and Jamal, which is, you know, bread and butter stuff, right? The thing with that game, or the thing with that play is that at the end of game, whatever, we're in game five. So at the end of game four, 
Um, the wolves started to guard that empty side action, three on two, um, and forcing Yoga Jamal to pass out of it. And I think the Nuggets tried to run it a couple times early in game five and then went away from it because they wanted to keep the ball in Yoga and Jamal's hands for the most, for the most part, not just with scoring, but decision making. It's one of those things that I've talked about on Twitter, like empty side actions are great when the other team is respecting the space. Um, but if they decide to smartly guard it three on two, uh, you can't really run it at that high volume. When the Nuggets went to in the fourth quarter, I think it caught the Wolves off guard a little bit because they hadn't really been doing it as much uh, with, again, Jamal handling uh, earlier in the game. So they were guarding it their normal way two on two. And uh, the Nuggets were able to generate some good looks out of it to close out that game. And one of the things that stood out really in both game five and game six is that the Wolves' point of attack guys, for the most part, are not really sticking to Jamal as well as they did in the first two games of the series. And I mean that in game six as well. Like Jamal is shedding these guys when he's coming up either on ball or off ball. Obviously off ball is a little bit easier because you have time to like set your man up for the screen a little bit better. Yeah, Jamal's just like moving better. He's not shooting particularly well. And we'll talk about that with respect to game six. But I wanted to know if you had any more thoughts on the Nuggets offense in game five. Yeah, I think the way that I kind of looked at it was the Wolves. We talked on the last episode that they were overhelping a little bit and Cat and Rudy were, you know, stunting or literally leaping out to contest Jokic shots in the paint when only one of them maybe needed to. Or if Jaden had Jamal covered on a drive, Rudy and or Cat were helping on that when they didn't really need to. to like Jaden probably had some of those drives covered. So they, I knew they were going to be much more disciplined in trying to um, stay home on some of those plays in game Five. So we got Jokic one on one with Rudy. We were able to force some switches, which also the Wolves fixed in game six uh, with going under screens and not switching on some actions. So in game five, obviously Jokic was able to go off since they were allowing it. We knew that even in going into the Lakers series, that the best, well, you know, the best hope you have is probably to double Jokic and try to make him pass and tr try to make anyone else beat you. The The strategy of letting Jokic just take over and score a bunch is not a good strategy. He's one of the best offensive players of all time. Then you get to game six. They're doubling Jokic from wherever. A lot. With whoever. They don't care where they're coming from on the court. They're just like, we're doubling Jokic. It doesn't matter if it's Gobert or Cat or whatever. They know Jokic can beat literally anyone on the team if he has to. So they said, hell no, we're not doing that. And... I will say there was less doubling when it was Cat, though. Yeah, I think he that did do a pretty good job. Games, in previous games, they would double when it was Cat when he was in foul trouble. Right. But right. otherwise not. And in this game, he wasn't in foul trouble. And I think mm -hmm. the, yeah, Cat doing a pretty good job standing Jokic up in the post definitely stymied a lot of what the Nuggets were trying to do, but so did some of their other adjustments. Like you were talking about the going under when it's like an inverted pick and roll, Jokic handling, whatever. They're just going under those screens so that they don't have to switch. There are ways to force that switch anyway or create better driving lanes for Jokic. Like we see, like I, I was just thinking about like, oh, what if AG just became like a monster just setting like Gortat screens for Jokic to get all the way to either to the rim or to just force the Rudy switch because um, Kat going under all of these screens is uh, it's a problem because Jokic isn't making his threes. There's a lot to say about it. We have to punish it in other ways. When I was like, I didn't rewatch the whole game, but I did rewatch the first quarter because to me, the story of the game. Yeah. yeah. To me, the game was just completely over. Once that first quarter happened, I know the Nuggets had big comebacks versus the Lakers. So there is the idea that the Nuggets can always come back. You know, this is a championship team, but this is the playoffs and teams are not going to just pick their foot 
up off the gas, especially complete teams like the Wolves who are yeah, insanely yeah, I never, athletic. Never expected them to make that big of a comeback against the Wolves. They are too good of a defensive team. Even if mm-hmm. you start to go on like little runs, like they're not going to be, um, they're not going to be big runs like that. And that I think is a huge difference between early season Wolves. I wouldn't just say playoff Wolves, but later in the season, season because earlier in the year the wolves did have a lot of games where it wasn't just like taking their foot off the gas defensively it was like their offense fully dries up turning the ball over a lot and then they let the opposing team go on big runs and lose these like giant leads like i saw that so many times in the first half of the season and i thought that it would be an issue for them in the playoffs as well but as the season's gone on they've been so stout so stout defensively that even when they go on those offensive droughts when they're up like it's really hard to to come back on them now yeah i mean this is arguably the two best teams in the playoffs We'll see how the Celtics are. If either of these teams have a lead, it's going to be much harder to come back because they are they just have so much talent and so much. They're both smart teams. They're both well coached. So it would, I would be shocked if either of these teams came back from like 20 points. Uh, and it's not unheard of in the playoffs. This is pretty normal with, with talented teams in the NBA. This is just what happens, especially when teams these days are so good offensively, like as much as we question the Wolves' ability on offense, they can put up numbers. And especially if the Yoke, or especially if the Nuggets aren't scoring, I almost call them the Jokic's. If I the wish Nug- if we had five Jokic's, then if the, the Jokic's aren't scoring, yeah, no, if the Nuggets aren't scoring, then it's like an exponential issue where now the Wolves are running. Now you have cross matches, or Anch is going to cook you and dunk it on you. And the Wolves can score, can shoot really well from three. So, like, you're just going to start getting so behind. And that's exactly what happened in the game. Uh, Jamal, like like you said, he was shedding defenders. Like, a lot of his looks in, in the first quarter, he was getting off of screens and Ant was completely trailing. It wasn't like Ant was going to block him from behind on him going to a floater or anything in the lane. And Rudy Gobert was just not even coming out to contest him. He was just sticking to AG or whoever it was and just letting Jamal take those shots and he just didn't hit him. And then that let Rudy get the rebound really easily too. And then they just ran and then our defense is completely, completely unorganized. And then you have like KCP on Rudy Gobert and like all these bad things that we don't want. So it was just a huge issue and it just played into their hand perfectly. So yeah, it sucks that we were looking at the next game thinking, well, we just need role players and the others to just hit their shots. Like you know, yeah, of course. I mean, you know, but the it's thing more is that. that because of how there's kind of two main two main things going on here. The Jokic handling, say, in, in pick and roll is being stymied because the Wolves decided to go under on all those screens and Jokic isn't hitting his threes. The post ups are being stymied because they're doubling off of him and then um, the other guys aren't hitting their shots. The pick and rolls being stymied because the Wolves have fully sold out, like fully sold out to make sure that AG is not getting anything and Jokic isn't getting anything and Jamal can't hit his shots or like layups. <laughs> he, he missed a layup off the side of the backboard. I couldn't help but laugh because they were already down like so big at that point. It was in the first half, I'm pretty sure. And I was like, I know they're not coming back in this game, but like, Jamal needs to figure figure this out because this is just kind of a clown show. And it's funny because like you you see how how much Minnesota has had to fully sell out, changing everything they do defensively. And kudos to them because they've had to, they've had to change so much just from last game, not even talking about the adjustments that they made earlier in the series. But because of how much Jokic thoroughly dominated them, they've had to change a lot of what they do defensively to fully sell out and just like basically pray that like turning Jamal into a scorer (laughs) is going to win them a game. And it did in game six. Now, part of why 
I'm the most nervous uh, about game seven, in addition to just anything can happen in a game seven, is just not knowing what Jamal we're going to get. Because when you look at all the looks that the Nuggets were able to generate, I generally don't like when we're taking a bunch of threes um, because it's not really the flow of the offense, like taking threes off of uh, off of those Jokic post of doubles. The other problem was when guys were attacking closeouts and getting into the lane, with the exception of Jamal and or Jokic and normally Jamal, like normal Jamal that you know, has two legs and two elbows because apparently his, he hurt his elbow or something in this game can make shots in the mid range, can make decisions from the middle of the floor, can get to the rim and finish at the rim. Rudy makes it difficult to do the latter, but nobody else on the team is except MPJ, I guess, uh, is someone that I trust to make a shot from the sort of, mid-range like short mid-range area and that is who the wolves are forcing to the middle of the floor like these are like relatively high value shots if you have guys who can make them and that was like a big thing that stood out in contrast to me in this game like not only were the wolves uh they had multiple players who could kind of kind of break you break you down off the dribble and either get to the rim or and finish there um, because of their athleticism, their length, but also make like a short floater. Whereas our guys could not do that. Like there was one play where I saw Christian, he kind of got deterred by Rudy at the rim. And then he went for the floater when Rudy kind of like stunts and then goes back and to, I think he was boxing out AG on that play, or maybe it was Yoke. And I'm like, man, Yoke is the only one who has this float. And that's what they're giving up. Not just floaters, but like can you make like a semi contested shot around the, around the rim? And our guys just have not been able to do that really most of the year. Jamal has been great there until he got hurt. Right. So now I'm sort of, my wheels are spinning thinking about what is it that the nuggets can do to counter that doesn't rely on Jamal just being better and it's crazy because if he was just even a little bit better, like these are just wide open lanes and wide open shots that are being given up because the Wolves have fully sold out to keep Yoke and AG uh, not as involved. They kind of gave up doing the whole ball pressure, really yes, intense up close that was huge. defense, uh, which we were expecting at some point. It's kind of interesting that they did it in an elimination game because it's a little bit of a gamble because it's not like the Nuggets are a terrible offensive team, but they played more relaxed. And I mean that very loosely. It's not like they you know, were bad on defense. They had great athleticism and energy all game. I'm just being in comparison to some of what we were seeing throughout the series where they were a little bit off on us, just packing the paint and loading up, giving yes, up shots. The wolves, they were not, they were not pressuring everybody up the floor yeah. anymore. They were really pressuring like AG sometimes, but mostly just Jamal because they didn't want to give up the cross matches anymore. And that's smart because giving up the cross matches completely mm -hmm. neutralizes yeah. everything that I just talked about. Yeah. Um. On the other side, on the on the defensive end, when like once you get to the half court, because the Nuggets just can crush you mm -hmm. if you're not in like the specific alignment fit, uh, and like the specific matchups that you need to specifically keep like Ag and Jokic less involved. It, it worked in their favor in this game. They really dared other Nuggets to beat them. They did not come through. Jamal and company could not finish at the rim, as you were just saying, which was really sad to see. Like, if you just look at this from like a bird's eye view, because I don't know what the Nuggets are specifically going to do to counter this, but you just got to hope that like I'll put on, I don't know, this kind of sounds like, what's the word, like making excuses or whatever, but cope. There's a, yeah, it kind of sounds like cope, but I'm hoping that the Nuggets kind of saw that the game was completely out of hand and just kept settling for outside shots as the game was going on and didn't try to 
dictate much on offense or go to counters that they could potentially do in game seven because they were like, wow, we're down. So let's just start, you know, shooting. Let's just, let's, you know, they didn't try uh, specific adjustments that I think are, yeah. are possible. And I'm just hoping no, I think that, that I think that's, it, I don't think that's cope. I think that's okay. true. Yeah. Um, there was not a lot done differently. Like they saw that the wolves were funneling the ball to Jamal when it was in pick and roll or funding like the scoring responsibility to Jamal when it was in pick and roll. And they basically kept that up and Jamal kept shooting. I remember I was like, Oh my gosh, he finally made a floater. It was like the shortest floater possible, like five yeah, feet something. Made one. Um, yeah. <laughs> what uh, do you go? One of 10 in that game? I think he was one of 11, like early or something like that, or I don't know, but yeah, it wasn't. It yeah. Wasn't great but him. they did, they didn't, they didn't really try too much. They were kind of taking the shots that the wolves gave them, especially, um, off the doubles. I think it was a little bit more aggressive in the second half. One of the things that I didn't really like about this game from him was that he was trying to anticipate the double. And you can contrast yeah. that to how Cap played, where he was actually passing really well out of the doubles, but he was also not going to wait for the double to come. He's like, no, I'm driving and I'm going to try to score here. The problem is I think that Cat is just a really tough defender for Jokic to... Um, get by in the ways that he likes to when it's just isolation and the bulls have done a really good job of stymieing the other avenues that they use that he uses to attack cat running him off of screens etc that was one of the reasons that he started taking a bunch of threes it's like okay if cat's just going under all these screens we're going to run some off ball actions for me to get out um and get some threes off of movement. I think there's some, I think there is other stuff that, that they can do. Obviously, like I, I was like, man, maybe the Nuggets are going to get really wonky with this and just like run some like double track for Yoke <laughs> and just try to run Cat off of like just multiple, multiple screens. One of the problems is that the Nuggets are still like this like methodical team on offense and the stuff that the what would be required to sort of shed. Now we're talking about Jokic trying to shed defenders, trying to shed Cat, take a little bit more time off the clock. And they don't have as much space to operate because the Wolves have abandoned their pressure defense. Yeah, there's there's stuff that can be done, I'm sure. It's just... I don't know, not just what nuggets are going to show up because Justin started to go cold like one and a half games ago. I wasn't surprised that he had a bad shooting night tonight and I'm pretty sure Malone's going to stick with him, but I think we could have really used just Peyton's energy and athleticism defensively in this game, especially because we weren't scoring anyway and Justin wasn't making his shots anyway. So it was like, I don't know, like let's just see what happens but i doubt that Mullen's gonna throw him into a game seven after not playing in the series basically since game one but there's there's stuff that can be done i'm not surprised about some of the cold shooting from like justin and uh christian and kcp made a couple shots we also missed a couple shots jamal was just like ice cold from three and there was one shot in particular that he missed uh, i think it was in the second half where, man, the shot form was way off, which is why I completely bought the thing about his elbow. Um, for, but that, that, that's, not an ex, that's an excuse for the jump shot. It's not really like an excuse for the decision-making at the rim, basically. The, I, we need to know what Jamal is going to show up in Game 7. And you know, he was all chipper, and he always is after a bad game, right? Um so I don't know. We'll see if he brings it because I don't think that it's just a matter of like having the right energy and contributing to winning in other ways. I think that he has to be better offensively based on how the Wolves are now guarding us because of how thoroughly Jokic destroyed them in game five. And then defensively, we just need a lot better from really everyone than we got in this game. I thought the cat was completely destroying the switching of our bench units. Like we really have a huge disadvantage in those units now that Rudy is playing with them. So he's actually like a really nice outlet for Kat. It's probably like the second best at getting the ball to Rudy after Mike Conley. 
um, which is why I was really like nervous that they might play more through Cat <clears throat> in Game 5, and they didn't. And uh, MPJ has had a really rough defensive series, but especially the last two games, um, or like two and a half games, and offensively, it feels like things are moving too quickly for him. And the Wolves have done a really good job of not even letting him get to a comfortable shot. There was one sequence in this game that was encouraging. And I really hope we see more of it in game seven, where he comes off the dribble handoff. And I believe it's uh, McDaniels was on him. And Nikhil kind of helps from one pass away or like kind of stunts at it. But he's like, no, I'm driving. I'm getting to the rim. And then he gets there and he finishes with an and one. And I think that's just like what he's going to have to do. It's the same thing they're doing to MPJ and Jamal are basically being guarded the same way off of these DHOs. And MPJ is having trouble shutting the defender for the jump shot. But he can get by them if he's like, I'm driving right now. And he made some better decisions when he, like, got there. If they're, like, collapsing, like, he was kicking out. There was one sequence I remember in game five that maybe it was game four where he, I'm like, man, the, I think it was AG was open in the corner. Whether you want AG to shoot that or not, like, just keep the offense flowing after I think Rudy came and just collapsed on him in the paint. And he didn't do that. He kind of, like, tried, like, tried to force up a shot. He was better about that in this game, like, kicking out whenever they collapsed. But in terms of getting himself open for the jump shot, it just wasn't there. So it's so weird how, um, yeah, right now the Wolves are giving Jokic and AG jump shots, and they're giving um, they're giving Jamal and MPJ driving lanes to the rim. And actually, Jamal's getting jump shots too, but he's just like missing all of them. MPJ isn't getting the jump shots because the defenders who are on him are a, quite a bit stickier. So the only way that you do that is with kind of downhill aggression. So it's interesting. It's like, okay, Nuggets, they are fully getting you out of what you like to do most, except Jamal is getting everything that he would normally be good at, but like hasn't been able to be effective at. Yeah, I feel like they were really loose on everyone else except for MPJ, where they were sticking to him and they were really closing out hard on him. And he attacked some closeouts, but... You know, he'll commit some turnover sometimes when he's doing that or he just won't finish at the rim. There were times where he got open and got like, I think he got a dunk in, in this game or something like that, but, or he got a layup on a cut. But yeah, I don't know what the Nuggets are going to I think we're missing to... him on cuts a lot too. And part of it is like just Rudy being there. I think both Yoke and Jamal aren't get like, he'll like come off these pin downs and he'll be open on the cut and they don't get to him. So they get to the like whoever the next option is in the action. And I'm like, guys, we're not generating anything right now. If nothing else, like just, you know, try to hit him on that pass. But Rudy's just there. And I'm like, I think that I think MPJ can try to take on that challenge. Looking at this from a broader view and this series from a broader view, the Nuggets lost the first two home games. And so then we had a ton of questions about what's going on with them. Thankfully, they had a very good response and won three games in a row. And I was hoping that meant that they were in another gear and had a different level of focus that was here to stay. I don't, it was like a, a make game six was a mix of kind of lack of focus, but also adjustments by the wolves and just bad play and execution from the nuggets we didn't melt down like we did in game two like we yeah I don't think we that's showed the thing is like this was a this was a way worse margin of loss but this game and the way that they like they didn't play well like i'm not gonna i'm not gonna say that they played well i'm glad they did because if they did and this was the final margin then it would have been extremely shocking um but this wasn't like the game two meltdown at all it was disappointing to see that whatever happened, happened again. I'm not as upset. Well, I was really pissed off after the game. But after a day and like a night, I'm not as upset as I was with game two. Just because like we just kind of quit. And I was questioning whether we could even compete with the Wolves. I know that we can compete with the Wolves now. It's just, and I know that like we had been talking about earlier, that blowouts can happen and these things can compound and it can get out of hand really fast. So I also just have to trust that Jokic, who has amazing basketball IQ, maybe in the best in the league, and we have good coaches, and we have smart players, 
I'm going to believe that they're going to rise to the challenge in Game 7 and put some stuff together and figure this out. So this is one of the first Game 7s this Wolves team has played. This is the first second round they've played. So I'm hoping that the Nuggets and their championship pedigree and the run that they've made and the experience they've had will be able to pull it out. Now, Jamal's health puts a lot of that into question because if he's just having another bad game, we may be in deep trouble. But uh, I think that, unfortunately, we can't just say, hey, the Nuggets are back. They focused up. The Wolves made them play their best basketball. This is now becoming an unfortunate pattern that the Nuggets have let down games. It's not completely terrible because this happens in the playoffs. It's We can't expect to have a 16-4 run every playoffs like we did last year where we're just smoking every team. The Wolves are an amazing team, so this is going to happen. So it's not horrible, but it's not like the Nuggets are the same team that we uh, want. That's okay. So we just got to get through this game and hopefully have a good rest of the playoffs. And I, God, I just want to get out of this series so bad. So it was a little tough to see. But is there any last minute thoughts before we move on to other series? Yeah, I just want to say like I totally see Game 7 as a coin toss because of my questions about Jamal. If Jamal was fine, I think we could have closed out in Game 6, honestly, as well as, as Minnesota was playing. And as even as badly as we were on defense, just because of how many like you see like minnesota's plan is just like jamal has to beat us and you know if he was 100 percent, he's capable of that but he's clearly not right now so i think that minnesota can still win the series obviously there's just one game left i think we'll probably know the answer just because the all of these games have been so weird i think every team every game has been a double digit game except uh what was it game four just because at the end the wolves kind of like chipped into it and then the nuggets were you know eating clock i i think that like we're, we're gonna know very early in game seven who's gonna win yeah and maybe not maybe it just turns into a rock fight like game seven against the jazz in 2020 and it's like 78 to 80 uh, we'll see if the Nuggets have it in them to be that stout defensively against this Wolves team that is able to create a lot of easy offense just with their athleticism. But, you know, we've also defended them well before. So we'll see. We will We will yeah. see. Yeah, there's potential uh, really annoying storylines that might come if we lose this game seven. And we are not going to talk about that right now because <laughs> we might win it. But we'll. it's going to be interesting if we lose what might be on the agenda to talk about. But, uh, yeah, let's go and talk about some other series. Another game that was over very quickly, not as quickly as the Nuggets game, but the Knicks-Pacers game five was close in the first quarter. The Knicks had a little bit of a lead, and then in the second quarter completely outscored them, and then the second half outscored them even more. So yes, I don't watch these as closely, so you can correct me if I'm wrong. But my, pr I was actually kind of disappointed with Siakam's defense in that game. I thought it was interesting. Like I don't think the plus-minus bared it out, but when Miles Turner went off the floor, the Knicks were just destroying them. Um, and I don't know how pivotal Miles Turner is in this series, but I was just like, dang, Siakam's just not doing it. Like, the Knicks are just getting whatever they want. And there were some times where he, he was deep in the paint off Josh Hart, and, like, he's in the paint, and Jalen Brunson, Brunson's driving in, but he's not even going to help on the Brunson drive because he's acting like, oh, I may have to recover to Hart. But he's so far away from Josh Hart that he has no chance to possibly get back to recover anyway. Yeah. So I'm like, you're effectively just doing nothing. And so I was like, dang, he, he's just not doing it. He's not yeah, helping total at no all. So I don't know what your impressions are of Siakam's defense or like what's going on with the Pacers. They, they're playing super fast. They were like running so fast after every miss, which I know they like to play fast, but they it just they didn't take care of the ball and then were turning it over a lot too. Like they just looked completely out of control in that game. So uh, yeah. I mean, McBride, he looked great. Alec Burks had a surprising amount of production. So the Knicks got what they wanted, and the Pacers just looked sad to me. So, so if you went back to, um, if you went back to January, and you told this is when this is after the OG trade, they started rolling a few games in. I think their first like 
first big like signature statement win. First of all, they won the um it was before OG started playing because he had been traded but hadn't started playing at Christmas Day game against the Bucks and they blow them out. OG starts playing, they get this massive blowout win against the Sixers. You go back there and you tell Tom Thibodeau that Alec Burks is going to be in his seven-man playoff rotation. What do you think he would say to you? What would Tib say to me? Yeah. This is, at this point, I'll tell you who's healthy. Brunson, Hart, DiVincenzo, I Hart, uh, OG, and Julius Randle. Um, obviously, Deuce is um, healthy, but I think he had only just started being in the regular season rotation because they had just traded Emmanuel quickly. All of that is the case. You tell Thibodeau, Alec Burks, who's not yet on the team, he's on the Detroit Pistons and sometimes getting DNPs, is going to be in your seven-man playoff rotation. What do you? What does he say to you? I think he says, hell yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, he tells you to fuck off because you're a crazy person, raving lunatic. <laughs> I mean, he had to somewhat approve getting Alec Burks back, right? I mean, that wasn't the like meat of the trade it was more about boy on yeah i, was just I don't think anyone back. thought alec burks was gonna even play in the regular season games and he barely yeah. did actually right <laughs> they I, had yeah. so many injuries well, they were like we on. just need someone to eat minutes and we're still playing mm -hmm. josh hart 48 minutes a night i didn't look at how um how much of alec burks's scoring came in like when the game was really out of hand like obviously when when the game is crazy. He was providing key buckets in big moments. Um, actually, it was the case in game... Uh, we're talking about game five right now. It was the case in game four as well, before the game got out of hand. He was providing some, like, key, like, just help us stay attached buckets before Indiana, like, ran away with it because Brunson was struggling so much. Well, so you know, the Knicks like with, are shorthanded. They need someone, so, I mean... Tibbs kind of and has no he, choice, he can but... shoot and he can <laughs> attack closeouts. He can also mm -hmm. kill a possession trying to play ISO ball, but he's largely been a play finisher with Brunson on the floor. And frankly, when he's off the floor, they can't create offense anyway. So you may as well try to run some stuff through him. Brunson actually, this, this game was a blowout and Jalen still played. It was 43 minutes because they, their offense when he's off the floor is just completely like, just non-existent um with respect to siaka i think that your observations about his defense were interesting because i didn't notice him that much defensively throughout this game but what i did notice was that isaiah hartenstein and to a lesser degree josh hart but yeah especially hartenstein getting a lot of offensive rebounds and 50 50 balls that they were not getting in previous games in large part because of siaka and miles turner he had so, so many offensive rebounds. That was a key story of the game. They killed them. What did he... I think he had more offensive rebounds than the entire Pacers team. In previous games in this series, I actually said it like like in my, my live tweet thread on the game. Early in the game, it seemed like, okay, Indiana's still keeping up this... Um, this pattern they have of the the, the the Pacers have been done a really good job previously of matching New York on the glass. First of all, not letting them get nearly as many offensive rebounds as they normally get, but also like crashing the offensive glass like crazy. And it wasn't just Turner and Siakam, but a lot of it was especially Siakam. Like he just has a crazy motor. Like I, after seeing him in the playoffs, especially, it's so evident to me why that organization thought that he was going to be a good fit with their team, with their play style. Cause he's just like frenetic. He's just like a little bit crazy. He just has a crazy high motor and he showed it on the offensive class in the early games of this series, even the ones that the Knicks won. Yeah. It's definitely stood out to me on this game that he was getting out hustled by Hartenstein because earlier in the series, especially in game four, when the Knicks got blown out, it felt like on both, on the offensive class and the defensive class, he was just not having the same impact that he'd had before. And part of that was Miles Turner in particular on the keeping him off the defensive glass and Siakam was gobbling up offensive rebounds. And then on the other end, it was, yeah, Hartenstein was just, he was just getting beat by all the other, other, all the other Pacers for offensive rebounds tonight. 
he came out and he said, nope, I'm going to do whatever it takes to win, even if it means getting more offensive rebounds than the other team uh, had total, just myself. Yeah, I think part of it does have to do with Siakam's defense. I think Josh Hart was like a little bit more muted in this game. I say that, and then I check the stats, and he still had 11 rebounds <laughs> in 39 minutes of play, um, including two offensive, only two offensive rebounds, so nine defensive rebounds. Hartenstein had 12 offensive rebounds. Yeah, that's what I was going to say, but then I was like, was that actually his total rebounds? But yeah, and 12 we had 17 offensive rebounds. Total rebounds. 17 total, and 12 of them were offensive. Yeah, I mean, he he did really well. He destroyed them just flying in and getting these rebounds. It's such a stark contrast from watching the Wolves with all their size and the effort that they put in in their speed versus the Pacers, who can be fast, but on defense, they're just like standing around and they're small. And God, it looks so enticing to me as a Nuggets fan to rather play them than the Wolves. Uh, but um, yeah. yeah, it's just because, you know, you see like Jaden McDaniels, these tall dudes running and like making contests and then i'm just seeing siakam who has height just like standing around not helping or doing anything like i think his defensive stats he was pretty good as the primary defender but like if he's out of the play then he's just like providing nothing and i was i was kind of shocked by that because he was like the tallest dude on the floor for the pacers for some of these minutes where the knicks were just going off on him and brunson had i think he had like 28 points in the first half there have been questions about his foot and some injuries and, you know, he hadn't had a good game in a bit to his standards. So Well, Neesmith cool had him. been locking him up, right, ever since they yeah. made Neesmith the primary on him. He just has – he has really good – he's just like a bigger Christian Brown, right, where he's like – he's got enough foot speed to uh, guard these like ones and twos, but he's also really strong and obviously like bigger – so I think that he was giving Brunson a lot of issues. I actually didn't like how much Indiana was willing to put uh, Nemhard on Brunson again because Jalen was just cooking yep. that matchup. Another he was just about... licking his chops every time he had Nemhard on him. And part of the part of what the Knicks did to try to free Brunson up in this game was setting much higher screens uh, i mean like the indiana has been picking up full court this entire playoffs and, and thus this entire series but like the knicks are setting screens for jalen at 90 feet with hartenstein with Hart, with mcbride just trying to free him up just to get the ball up the floor the other thing with Thibodeau changing his starting lineup to include uh deuce mcbride instead of presses achua is now that they've gone small, they have more offensive options. Um, and Juice being, being able to bring the ball up the floor, because he does have that sort of, you know, at least some like relatively reliable ball handling. It has, you know, freed Jalen up, freed his legs up a little bit on some possessions, but also given the multiple like ghost screening options, they can't hide you know, Tyrese Halliburton on Precious Achua anymore. And so the Pacers are constantly in a state of hedging and recovering on all these different screening actions. You know, to Hallie has sort of handled that with varying degrees of success because they don't want to give up, obviously, the switch of Halliburton onto Brunson. And I actually think that he could probably do a decent job with his length, but they're just, they're not going to, they're like, we're not playing around with that. I think that's probably the right, uh, play like make the other guys make shots, but I think these Knicks role players have largely stepped up when you needed them to. Obviously, that's how they got to this situation where they're up three two in the conference semifinals. But Indiana is definitely not out of this um, by any stretch of the imagination, especially because there's more meat on the bone for Halliburton himself. Like he was very passive in this game. Yeah. Do you think the Knicks are going to win the series or do you think the Pacers can bounce back? Well, I think the Pacers can bounce back. Do you think but they I will? do think the Knicks <laughs> are going to win the series because yeah. with the exception of game four, they've been in every single game that they've played, even the ones that should have been blowouts because their opponent like shot, you know, 50% from three, whatever. I think the tips has been really 
malleable with his rotations, with his starting lineup changes, with all the different things offensively they're doing just to free up Brunson. And it's been interesting to watch him just play chess with Nick Nurse. And now he's playing chess with Rick Carlisle, all these guys that are known as like these like great X's and O's coaches. And Tibbs has been able to just counter every counter, but also have this really well-coached team in terms of like they bring the energy almost every night. Like really that game four was the only time uh, this playoffs where I was like, ooh, they're getting kind of boat raced in the energy and hustle departments. But then you see the response in game five where they only shoot 34% from three. They shoot 46% from the field and they win by 30 points because they had 20 offensive rebounds. If you look at the the overall possession battle, the Knicks had 101 field goal attempts and the Pacers had 72. Crazy. Yeah, they're smoking him. Uh, you know, maybe Brunson can just Jimmy Butler the Celtics out of the playoffs again. I don't know about that. The Knicks <laughs> yeah. are heavily injured, and I think Tatum is a lot better this year than he was last year. I don't think Jimmy Butler could Jimmy Butler the Celtics out of the playoffs. Well, yeah, he this can't year. this year. Maybe Hartenstein can destroy injured little KP over there, and Brunson can <laughs> score 40 every night, and boom. Bye, Celtics. Do you want to go to Mavs OKC? Yeah, let's do it. That series has been only recently interesting. So uh, I picked Dallas in this series because I thought that they would just have the size advantage and just kill OKC on the glass and that Luka and Kyrie would be able to make shots. Throughout most of this series, OKC has largely kept the glass even and even won the offensive class in some of these games, and Luka and Kyrie have not been making shots. And yet, <laughs> the Mavs are up 3-2. <laughs> so there's a couple of uh, couple of things that, um, that stood out to me between games five and six. So the Thunder were able to take game five. Oh, sorry, not game five and six, game four and five. They were able to get, the Thunder were able to take game four in Dallas, which was crazy because Dallas was largely outplaying them and uh, controlled the game for most of it. They went up double digits early and basically didn't relinquish that lead until um, sort of middle of the fourth quarter. The problem was that at any point when the uh Mavs were trying to extend their lead their offensive I think their offensive process was highly flawed and in addition to that anything easy that they tried to get was was completely stymied by the OKC defense they were able to force very timely turnovers and Chet was able to get timely blocks. And then in that fourth quarter, as OKC just started chipping and chipping away into the Mavs lead by getting those big stops, and then Shea was hitting tough shots, but they're shots that he can make. I think the Thunder were able to figure out ways to get him a little bit better space against um, against the Mavs defense. At the end of game four, and so I really called game for a choke job for Dallas because they really controlled it basically the entire time, but were never able to, you know, blow it open. And they let OKC hang around. OKC made some late adjustments, and then they made some big shots late, and they were able to take it. Dallas also, like, shot 52% from the free throw line as a team. A lot of it was Luka misses, and the bigs, they're the ones who get fouled most of the time anyway. Yeah, like, and Luca had a chance to tie the game late, actually, at the free throw line, but he missed, um, he missed one of two, I believe, in that situation. His free throw shooting was bad. It was just, like, a horrible Luca game, really on both ends, but uh, especially late when, like, guys got to have it. Kyrie was forcing some stuff, but also not being aggressive in the right moments. It was just... A really bad game from their stars. Then comes game five. We're back in OKC. The Thunder have a chance to take control of the series, take back the lead at, on their home floor. And Dallas absolutely killed them. 
game five comes around and Mark Dagnall makes the change that everybody on NBA Twitter wanted him to make. He started Isaiah Joe over Josh Giddy. We saw in this game, and we saw in, in some previous games where he would summon like Aaron Wiggins over Josh Giddy because Josh Giddy was kind of messing up their spacing offensively because Dallas was ignoring him, right? Um, we saw it in those games how, especially when J Dub is off the floor and it's just SGA, the lack of other um, secondary ball handling next to Shea. And playmaking really stifles this Thunder offense. And in addition to that, when you have Isaiah Joe on there, especially, but even with Aaron Wiggins, you make a small team even smaller. And so in game five, when Isaiah Joe started over Josh Giddy, I was actually encouraged for the Thunder because in a couple of sequences, like he was taking charges, he was hustling on the offensive glass. He was very active early. However, whenever we got into the half court, it's not like Dallas was letting Isaiah Joe get a bunch of open shots. He got an open corner three early, and I was like, okay, this is one of those nights for Dallas. But after that shot, they were closing out on him very hard, and the rotations on defense were incredibly crisp, not just on not on Isaiah Joe attacking closeouts, but on every Thunder uh, attacking a closeout to where they were forcing them to make decisions. And a lot of the time when it wasn't SGA or JDev, there was they were over penetrating. And then you have either Gafford or Lively at the rim, especially Lively. Uh, he's been so impactful defensively in this series that just deter anything there. And then the other uh, Mavs were not staying home on their shooters, but, you know, playing playing the gaps and making all of those kickout passes a lot harder. And they were just really, there were multiple efforts on defense multiple times. And I love those possessions where it ends in a shot clock violation because you know that the team worked really hard on defense on that possession, especially against the Thunder, who just keep coming at you in waves. Like they never stop playing the same way. So you have you basically have to short uh, force shot clock violations on them in order to be effective, and that's what Dallas did. I think that some of the the non Shea Thunder players really struggled with Dallas's ball pressure on closeouts. Like Dallas had really good closeouts, and I mean everyone. Like Luca was really good. Derek Jones Jr. was really good. Kyrie has been really good defensively in this series, despite his offensive woes. And we saw early in this series, and especially in this game, that Chet and J-Dub's handles were scouted extensively. <laughs> um, those two players in particular have, they don't have the tightest handles, frankly. So when they're driving, if you're collapsing on them, go go for the ball. Because you'll probably get it or at least mess with their dribble. Force them to pick it up or force them to fumble it a little bit. Uh, and I think that, like, it, it's just... This whole this this game was interesting because it really encapsulated some of the limitations with the Thunder's offense. Like I thought the size would be an issue for them defensively, but they ended up having more issues offensively than I would have predicted, especially against Dallas. And part of that is because Dallas has improved substantially as a defensive team. It was ironic that it was after the Gafford and PJ Washington trades when to me. P.J. Washington's been great on the perimeter, but Derek Lively's rim defense has been the biggest factor in these playoffs for Dallas. Not Luka. It's been Derek Lively's rim deterrence because they're winning all these games on defense because their offense has been struggling so much. And then OKC did a lot of switching in this game. I thought that Dallas was really smart about getting Luka off the ball a lot early. Like I remember the first possession of the game, Dallas wins the tip and Luca gets the ball and then he gives it to PJ Washington to bring it up up, up the floor. I don't I was like, I don't think I've ever seen that before. Um, but he was off ball for large stretches of this game, really until the end, like fourth quarter. And I was like, okay, here's Dallas going away from everything that, you know, got them to this point of getting like another strong lead over the thunder, but then Luca made some like crazy shots and it was whatever. 
But the thing I wanted to point out was that getting Luca off ball and running some off ball actions for him to force switches was really effective. And I thought OKC gave up those switches a little too easily uh, sometimes, but it's kind of part of it's part of their base scheme scheme they have a lot of really good perimeter defenders it's kind of like where you don't want anyone but Neesmith on Jalen Brunson his ex-teammate you don't want anybody but Ludor on Luca because I think it was Matt Moore that had this stat the Mavs have like a 119 offensive rating when anybody but Dort is guarding Luca oh my god and then it's like 90 something when Dort's on Luca Wow. It's crazy. Luca did get the best of Dort in some sequences in this game, but it was mostly him cooking like Case and Wallace. They were hunting out the SGA switch. It was just like you don't want anybody but Dort on Luca. Um, he was making his step back three in this game, and that was really helpful. But he was passing really well as usual too, because OKC started selling out to um to stop him. And I thought that their transition defense maybe suffered a bit in this game because of how aggressively they were attacking the offensive class. I think they were trying to do kind of what the Pacers have been doing to the Knicks, where they're like, well, we generally have a disadvantage in this area. But if we can kind of make it up in some way, then it won't be as bad, even though we're giving, we might be giving up some offensive rebounds, but maybe we'll get some on the other side. But I think their transition defense suffered in this game, and there were multiple transition lobs to, I think it was PJ. Derek Jones Jr. got at least two from Luka. Derek Lively got at least one from Luka and maybe another one from Kyrie. Daniel Gaffer got transition lobs. And so I think maybe OKC will stop crashing the offensive class as much, although they got some you know wide-open threes out of that because defense is scrambled, all of that stuff. So there was just there was a lot going on in this game uh, that was interesting because of how many adjustments both teams made. Because like I'd never seen Luca off ball that much um, in any playoff game so far, and it was a really smart adjustment. It's interesting how many teams are just like, how do we free up our point guard? <laughs> against ball pressure that's like half of the playoff series so far we've talked about that very issue perimeter defense underrated and also point guards are important so if you can free them up stomp, and they're playing them. well yeah but yeah. you know let's just give defensive player of the year to rim protectors every single year it's so annoying um well Marcus yeah smart. Marcus smart i know i guess i have to just live with that and be happy even though i like that wouldn't be the player I would have picked, but <laughs> I should just count my blessings on that one. Um, I, I think the Mavs and OKC have some flaws. I think whoever wins Denver and Mini is going to smoke them, and then the Western Conference Finals possibly a sweep. That's how I'm feeling right now. Yeah, so it's, it's going to be interesting to see. Do you have last thoughts on that series before we head out, or any any other last shot? Any last? Uh, thoughts? Yeah, I just think that. Uh... OKC is still in this. They shot incredibly poorly in this game. They haven't shot well this whole series from three. They're not generating as many wide open threes, but they're missing some timely ones in the games that they've lost, right? I also think it'll be interesting to see if Dagnall sticks with Isaiah Joe in the starting lineup, and maybe he'll go to Aaron Wiggins. Maybe he'll go back to Giddy. Because I do think that some of the ish, like the reasons that he keeps getting in the starting lineup presented themselves pretty glaringly in this game, especially because he wasn't starting at all in either half. I also just wanted to give a shout out to Jarek Jones Jr. and for Jason to, to Jason Kidd for playing Derek Jones Jr. and finishing with him because he made just a bunch of winning plays in this game. I think he got subbed out late in game four because he wasn't making his threes. Um, Dallas was still up at that point. But the he just provides so much on defense. He did make his shots in this game. Like I said, he had those transition lobs from Luka. He's a great roller. He provided a great outlet for Luka and Kyrie off of getting doubled in both ISO and in pick and roll. And, oh, he had like a crazy block on a three from Chet. And the only other person that I'd seen do that was Wemby. So... You know, 
Shout out to Derek Jones Jr. He's been great for them. He was actually on my list for the Nuggets last offseason. It was yeah, maybe one of the him. best they got signings him on a minimum. of like the year. I was thinking about him for like a taxpayer MLE, but they got him on a minimum. And I'm like, why couldn't we get him on a minimum? I don't know. If we don't make it out of this series, we're going to be asking a lot of questions like that. Yeah, because he can finish at the room. Damn. Oh, yeah. There you go. Going to need some dunks from Justin Holiday. Need Justin Hopefully. Holiday to dunk on Rudy Gobert. It's going to be a really intense Game 7. We didn't have any Game 7s all the way through the last playoffs. So we're going to be going back to those days of Blazers and Spurs series. Um, it's been a while, so I'm not looking forward to that. I hate Game 7s. I, <laughs> I mean, it's very entertaining. It's intense. It's it's Game 7 energy. But as a fan, oh, God, it's hard to watch. I have to so. ask you, if it's – I think Minnesota, if they win this series – smokes OKC. I think they also smoke Dallas, but I don't know that they do. When you say smoke, are you saying like they'll win in four or five or? Yeah. Yeah. Especially think, yeah. because like, I think Dallas has been a hell of a lot better defensively than I expected. I think that they don't have a good matchup for cat though. And especially with Maxi Kleba, he's like, he's out basically for the rest of the playoffs, regardless of how far Dallas makes it. And that presents its own um, its own issues. But I think they have better rim defense than, than I thought they would. And we'll see if, you know, the Wolves can hit outside shots. But I think they should smoke the Thunder. So I just wanted to get your thoughts yeah. on that. I think that they're going to destroy either team. <laughs> I just... Unless they're, like, so exhausted from playing the Nuggets and they're like, wow, that was so tough. And they kind of, like... Uh, relax. Yeah, they relax or just lack focus or something. I could see that just because they, they haven't made a full run. So I feel like with the Mavs, uh, you know, veteran status and, um, yeah, a little more size, better, better rim protection, they're going to need it. Like, the team that has more size and athleticism and just physicality is going to hold up better. So they definitely have more of a chance than OKC. I still think they're going to lose. I, like I give OKC games. zero chance after seeing them against <laughs> yeah. the Mavs. I don't zero care if chance. they come out of this series. I just, they are not beating Minnesota. Yeah, it's I think you're, you're 100% right. They're going to get crushed. Like, and could single-handedly destroy them, I feel like, at this point. Like, oh, God. They're not going to score. Yeah. On the Wolves. It's going to be bad. It could be like blowouts every game. We'll see. We're going to come back uh, to this and then OKC wins the conference. <laughs> wow. That'd be so shocking. Oh, uh, uh, my legacy dead. <laughs> I actually will be rooting for that. If Minnesota gets past this, I'll be rooting for OKC. You're going to be rooting for small ball? Yes, I'm you know, staunchly. You know, OKC is basically the new Warriors. Mm, I, I guess that's true. But I just can't accept the Wolves winning. <laughs> I'm so over them and over. I cannot Last episode, accept... you were like, "I hope we just win so I can start liking Ant now." And now you're like, "I, I know. hate the Wolves." <laughs> I know. I, yeah, now I hate them, and I can't. I don't want Tim Connolly to get success for this Rudy Gobert trade. Like, I'm glad it worked out for him, and he can't get criticized for the trade. But I don't want the trade to result in a championship. So I'm fully on Celtics winning the finals over the Wolves. I'm sorry to say. So we'll see. If the Wolves get there, I hope we don't even have to be talking about this at all and the Nuggets just go and that's great. <laughs> well, I'm definitely not going to be rooting for the Celtics to win. So uh, Yes, fully accepting of that. Unless it's, just it's OKC, the lesser... like I might just have to. But man, if OKC won, then it's like, man. No, I can't. I don't want them to win either. They're too young. <laughs> that's why I'm like the only team I can really pick at this point is the Celtics because at least they're like a very historically formidable regular season team and my thing is like the narratives win. like the but narratives like... that the celtics lose to either mini or okc are just like look i get it it's not us but west is best northwest yeah, division dominance be celtics aren't that good because this they can... lost to like this young and experienced team like, if I just put on my troll hat, though, we can twist all these into our favor. If the Celtics just win and beat these West teams, I still could say the West is best because the Celtics had no challenge and an easy run to the through the playoffs, and they were just rested and ready to no, beat the no. batted and bruised West teams. Yeah, that's that's valid. 
you'd be like, man, the Minnesota, they had to play the Nuggets in a seven-game series, and then they had to play the Mavs in a six-game <laughs> series. Luca and Kyrie, oh my God. We're already and... planning our Cope segment. It's going to be great. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, I mean, hopefully the Nuggets just win and none of this has to happen. But we'll see. We'll definitely be doing another episode after Game 7. Give our takes and reactions. Either either one of these teams are going to be going out, so we'll be doing Cope. Cope Springs Eternal and talking about why either of these teams lost and why they were eliminated and talking some future possible future storylines with these teams. We'll see uh, if any other teams are eliminated by next time. So hopefully you guys stick around for that. Any clothing closing thoughts for you from you, Grace? Losing sucks. And I would like to win, but also my mind is already ready to start talking about the draft so Whoa. just to protect my heart i've definitely not gotten there i'm just like following ct fazio if you i'm sure people listening to this know him hunter solace i'm on the hunter solace train for the nuggets you love gonzaga guys former mm-hmm. gonzaga guys there will be so many silver linings if we do get eliminated you know the nuggets are still a good team we can retool in the offseason we got yeah. young players especially after better like next they year. showed like they don't just suck after game two yeah. that makes the, the offseason so conversations better. maybe a little bit more comfortable yeah um i will say on julian i really he had a rough stretch during game uh game six but <laughs> but he made the layup that allowed the Nuggets to score 70 points and not score less Got than us 70, to 70 points. So I appreciated that. I almost wanted to stay in 60 to, into the 60-point range. You wanted range. it to be like a record? Just for it to be like, wow, look how fluky that was. We only scored 60 points. But I mean, 70 is just 70 is fluky. Yeah. That was the least points in a playoff game since 2018. So. Uh, yes. Thank you for listening. If you've made it this far, please, of course, like we always say, subscribe and like. We appreciate all the likes that we've been getting. It's been awesome. And comment. Let us know what you think. Follow us on Twitter. Come say hello. Leave a rating on Spotify and Amazon Music. We're working on getting on Apple Podcasts. So if you're hoping for that, hopefully we'll have good news soon. And just remember, winning is fun and losing really sucks. It really does.